hello welcome back to my channel I hope you are doing good so to follow up on my video on what happens after we quit as the scapegoat of a narcissistic family dynamic over the next few videos I want to focus on the kinds of feelings that you can expect as you recover from decades of psychological and emotional abuse so going no contact with your narcs can feel a lot like grief following a death and if you've decided to cut off the enablers and golden child, as well as the main narc, it's losing your entire family in one fell swoop. And the first stage of grief is shock and disbelief. And this was definitely what I experienced at the start of my journey out of scapegoating abuse. Us scapegoats were brainwashed for our entire lives, believing that we were the problem, we were the bad kid, and that there was something fundamentally wrong and unlovable about us. And realising that this was a crock of poop hits us like a bus and awakens us to the fact that we were the target of a sustained campaign of cruelty orchestrated by the very people who were supposed to love us unconditionally. And memories of key events in our lives come flooding back and as we process them through narcoware eyes, we become consumed with rage as we discover how our family actively sabotaged us at every opportunity. You might feel disturbed by the depth and extent of the sheer raw anger that floods through you. Scapegoats are generally gentle empaths and these feelings might even make you wonder if you actually are the bad guy, simply for having such unfamiliar emotions after keeping them bottled up for years. Be reassured that no, you're not toxic for feeling this way and you are not the narcissist. You are furious on behalf of you as a child. And whenever I've been asked the philosophical question, what would you do if you could be sent back in time with all the knowledge you have right now? I always think I'd go back to being four years old and I would mercilessly read my family for filth, telling them they're sick in the head and are so weak They'd rather bully a tiny child than man up and go to therapy. Feeling rage over your mistreatment is completely natural and it will pass, but pay attention to what you're feeling and write it down for future reference. As you go through the stages of recovery, you'll find moments of, was it really that bad? And you may be tempted to break no contact. By having your rage notes, you have the ability to do a reality check and reassure yourself that yes, it was that bad, and no, you should not break no contact. Something that I found helpful at the rage stage was to write an expletive-filled letter to my narcs, for my eyes only, detailing everything that I wanted to scream at them. It's very cathartic, and in getting those feelings out of your head and onto paper, you can ease some of the anger you're feeling. Some people make a ritual of this, writing their letter, reading it aloud and then burning it. I personally recommend keeping it somewhere secret so you can refer back to it, both to help in moments of rose-tinted reminiscence on the extremely rare good days with your narcs, and to check back on when you're recovered, just to see how far you've come. And as well as fury, you'll also experience disbelief at this stage of recovery from scapegoating abuse. You'll also find that without exhausting daily interaction with your narcs, a huge amount of mental bandwidth is freed up and repressed memories start rising up, demanding your attention. So a notebook or your note app is your best friend at this stage. Educating yourself about narcissism and scapegoating can unfortunately be a double-edged sword the more you learn, the more light bulb moments you'll have and the more indignation you'll feel about how you've been treated by your family. You might even have moments of denial. Surely nobody is evil enough to spend a lifetime actively destroying their own child. This self-doubt was intentionally planted in us by our narcs. We were trained not to trust our gut and were kept in a permanent state of confusion and second-guessing ourselves. A huge part of recovery is to reject the false narrative we were forced to believe. The one that told us we were significantly flawed, the crazy one, the screw-up. 
we're actually the most sane, emotionally mature person in our families. And we need to start listening to that nagging voice of reason that's always been in our heads. Another thing you might find yourself feeling at this stage of recovery is an intense desire for revenge. This is perfectly normal and natural. You'll want to scream your truth from the rooftops, perhaps publicly expose the narc, ripping the fake facade into shreds and watching the narc's world burn. I fantasised about writing a scathing expose and sending that, together with medical letters detailing my CPTSD, diagnosis, and doctor's suspicions about my being subjected to Munchausen's as a child, and I'd send this to every single person in my narc's town. The issue with this is that our narcs are all too aware of the risks associated with being exposed. This is why they've smeared us behind our backs our entire lives. Even during periods where we, be, we were being love-bombed and had moments of peace amid the chaos of abuse, it's guaranteed that our narcs were telling anyone who'd listen that we're troubled and mentally ill. This smearing goes full throttle when we go no contact, as the narc is all too aware that they need to cover their bums, just in case we choose to blow the lid off their fake lives. Our narrative is automatically discredited with a, see, I told you they were crazy, and a sympathetic nod from all the people under the narc's spell. But you can still get revenge on your narcs, and it's extremely easy. Going no contact in and of itself is your revenge. Narcs are all about power and control, and of course narcissistic supply. By going no contact, the narc knows that you know exactly what they are. You know they're fake and you see right through them. You know about narcissistic supply and you know the power you possess over the narc by starving them of this, simply by refusing to engage with them. They can no longer control you. They are no longer superior to you. And as we know, narcs are major control freaks. You've ripped off Darth Vader's intimidating mask and revealed the pale, weak creature underneath. They spent decades of time and energy grooming you, conditioning you, studying you like a bug under a microscope to learn how you tick, how to trigger you, how to get your attention and validation, how to push the buttons they installed in you. By going no contact, the dynamic shifts and you take your power back. Narcs can't deal with situations they have no control over. They have to know how every situation will pan out. It's their movie and they're the main character. They write the script for every aspect of their lives. And when you deviate from this, they're bewildered, scared and confused. They're suddenly the ones consumed with major anxiety and dread, not us. They never warned us when they launched their little silent treatments and sent us into tailspins of emotional turmoil. Quietly going no contact does the exact same thing to them. It's important though to note that no contact is not the same as the silent treatment. Silent treatment is a childish, maladaptive coping mechanism, a toddler tantrum to manipulate and regain control over a rebellious source of supply. The intention is to get a rise out of their target and to get them back in line. It's punishment for bad behaviour. No contact is an act of self-preservation and survival. The last dose of silent treatment I received nearly ended me and going no contact literally saved my life. By removing yourself as premium grade, carefully engineered source of narcissistic supply, you've significantly weakened the narc's facade, especially if they're ageing. As narcs get old, the opportunities to obtain supply dwindle. There's no longer a place of work to bully colleagues. The youthful good looks and charm have long gone, and they no longer have as much cash to buy people's affection. Extended family and long-term friends have either been discarded too long ago to hoover back, or have long since tired of the BS and drifted away. The narc's circle of influence gets smaller and smaller, and it's ultimately limited to their immediate family. Now you've gone, you've closed that circle even tighter. Going no contact is the ultimate revenge, as you've struck at the heart 
of the NARP's childhood abandonment issues and attachment disorder. You're silently telling them, you're insignificant, your existence has zero impact on my life. I don't trust you, I don't need you, I don't miss you, you're beneath me, you are nothing. And if you think maybe I'm being a bit too harsh, refer back to your rage notes and reassure yourself that no, you're giving the narcs everything they deserve. Your anger is justified, and by managing it in a healthy way, it's an important step in your recovery. So, this concludes the first in a series I'll be doing on the stages you'll experience as you recover from scapegoating abuse. And I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, look after yourself. Bye-bye.